Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Jenny, and I am so glad to welcome you all here to church with us tonight. Uh, if you're here in the room with us or joining us online, we're very glad to have you. Uh, for me, when I come in those doors in the weekend, uh, whether I'm up here leading or out there observing or learning, uh, I just have kind of a sense of calm come over me because I get to walk in and sit down or stand up here and let everything go that I've been carrying with me through the week and just give it to the Lord and know that he'll take care of it for me. So I hope and I pray that y'all feel that same thing when you're here with us. Uh, and tonight, as we turn our hearts toward God, I hope you consider that and just can think about that a little bit as we sing together. So for those of you who are able, I will invite you to stand and we'll join together in singing. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress, you are my portion, you are my hiding place, I believe you are the way.
next song is a new song for us. It's not a new song. It's been out there for a little while. Uh, but it just talks about how God is our firm foundation. No matter what's going on in our lives, how great things are, the highest of highs, the lowest of lows, God is always there and gives us a solid place to stand. And Maddie's going to lead us on this one. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaking. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, cause he's never
on you Christ is my firm foundation We thank you so much that you're our firm foundation. Whether we're built in the sunshine when there's no rain, built on your solid rock, or whether the rain's pouring and shaking our shutters, God, we know that we are built on you, on the solid rock we stand. We thank you so much for being our shelter, our fortress, our foundation. Let us have ears to hear and hearts open to your message today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, again, welcome. We're so glad to see all of you here tonight. Uh, for those of you here with us in the room, there are two ways we like to know that you're here. Uh, if you are new with us or have been here for a while and been checking us out and are ready to kind of take the next step, there are QR codes on the back of the chairs in front of you. You can scan that and give us a little bit of information and we'll get in touch with you. And every time you do that, we make a $5 donation to one of the food ministries here in Durango in your name that we partner with. And the other way we like to know you're here is if you would just turn and greet the people around you and say hello. Great job, Maddie. Hey everybody, welcome to Summit Church. We're so glad to have you here in worship with us this weekend. My name is Jenny and I'm the communications coordinator here at Summit. And I'm also one of the interim worship leaders. If you're ever looking for any information about things that are going on here at the church, all you have to do is go to our website at www.summitdurango.org. My name's Eric. I'm also one of the worship leaders here and get to join in on the weekend services. And if you are a musician and you sing or play an instrument, we would love to sit down and chat with you. We're looking for more uh, team members to join our weekend worship experience. And uh, we'd love to sit down and talk with you, see if that's a fit for you and uh, have you join us in worship. And the other thing we'd like for you to know about this week is the river baptisms coming up. We do this annually. Last year, we moved it to the river behind the rec center, and that's where we're going to do it again this year. It'll be on Sunday, August 26th, after the 1155 service. So if you or somebody you know would like to be baptized or reaffirm your baptism, just talk with Kara in the front office, and she can take care of all of that for you. Now let's uh, take a minute and prepare our hearts for the message. Worship. I'm so glad you're here. My name's Wade Griffith and delighted to have you worshiping with us tonight. If you would take a moment and bow your heads and pray with me and for me. Loving God, we thank you for this opportunity to gather in your house. We thank you for the truth that your Holy Spirit is here with us. 
We ask that your Holy Spirit would bring your word to life. We ask that your Holy Spirit would speak to each of us. Lord, you know that each of us come here with different things on our mind tonight. It could be tragedy. It could be joy. It could be things to do tomorrow or things and tasks that are just weighing us down. We all have so many different things on our mind, Lord, but you're aware of all those things. And I ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would speak to each of us wherever we are in our lives. Whatever burden we're carrying, whatever's on our minds, whatever we've brought with us, Lord, thank you that you receive us no matter what we bring. No matter what baggage we're carrying, you welcome us into your house. And I pray, Lord, that you would speak to each of our lives, that you would give each of us bread for the journey, that you would encourage us and comfort us, that you would speak to us tonight, Lord, words of encouragement, words of truth, and most of all, words of grace and love. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, my name is Wade Griffith. I'm a United Methodist pastor from Alabama, and I have the opportunity, the privilege from time to time to fill in for Pastor Jeff and I love to do it, and so I want to thank you for the opportunity. It's always a huge treat. And tonight, I want to talk about the drama that is our lives, and some truths about that that I think can be transformational for us. And to start that, I just want to share with you a little bit about my early ministry. I went to seminary at Vanderbilt in Tennessee, and then served churches in Alabama for 22 years. And served a number of churches, met my wife Julia at a, at a church, which is a whole funny story in and of itself. You can ask her sometime. But the first church I was sent to after seminary was embroiled in a theological battle within the church. It was very unhealthy. There were a group of people that had one perspective on some controversial issues. There was a group of people that had another perspective. And this group was trying to get the pastor fired which was really weird for me because I was the associate pastor and the head pastor, a man by the name of Dan Kitchens that I was working for, my boss, had been my pastor when I was a boy at a church, the church I went to growing up. So he was like a spiritual father for me and seeing him go through that conflict that that church was in and people really, a group of people trying to get him fired and just seeing the grace that he showed was amazing. But it was a really hard thing. It was, it was difficult. It was painful. After that church, I was moved to a church in Birmingham that in the middle of the year needed a pastor because the pastor there had an inappropriate relationship with the worship leader. And so I was put into that situation and it was a really painful, difficult, confusing situation. That was the church where I met Julia. Um, so God definitely brought a blessing out of that for me. But it was a tough thing. The church I went to after that about killed me. It was so hard. That church had uh, oh, so many difficult things going on. And it was a church in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And I want to tell you a story about that. That church, you know was very unhealthy in some ways, handled things with secret meetings and all this kind of stuff that, that kind of blew me away as a pastor. I had some mentors in my life who were really helping me. Still, I was still a very young pastor at the time. And this one mentor would gather pastors every now and then, uh, younger pastors, to go out to lunch. And then he would go around and say, how are things going with you? How are things going with you? And when they got to me, it was one of those situations where I said something that I didn't even really know that I thought. And I was like, did I just say that? He said, wait, how's it going with your church? And I said, I hate this church. <laughs> and, I, and everybody like, everybody, like stopped. It was like, it was like the record player scratched you know, at the bar or restaurant and everyone's like silent. The whole restaurant got silent. You know, It's like one of those situations. And he looked at me, he goes, might be time for a change. Might be time for, might be time for a change. Uh, it was hard. Julia would see me come home from work and, and I'd be sitting out on the back of my car crying at that church, just weeping, talking on the phone to my mentor, thinking, I'm not sure that this, I'm cut out for this. We moved from that church, which was important, <laughs> and to another church. And when I got to that church, the church I was at for 10 years before I came here, 
After I was appointed there, the bishop called me like the next week. He said, by the way, I didn't tell you some things about this church. That's never good. He said, they've been in a precipitous decline in attendance from like 300 down to like 120, and they owe $10.5 million in debt. And they have like 120 people. And, you know, I don't really have a concept of $10 million. <laughs> you, know, you know, let's talk about $1,000. I'm with you there. I understand what $1,000 is. And so you can see, like, in my ministry life, it was like one hard thing, one hard thing, one hard thing, one hard thing. What I want to say to you is that, you know, that's, that's our human condition. This is a pattern that is replicated in our families, our work, our mental and physical health, our personal lives and relationships. I have some good news and some bad news for you tonight. Which would you like first? Bad news. Well, it's the same news, but it's good and bad, okay? Life is difficult. Life is difficult. But guess what? After you accept Jesus, life is still difficult. Life is always difficult. Life is a series of problems that we encounter. Think about your life. Think about your health. Think about your family. Think about your career. Think about your friends and family and things that they've gone through. Think about hard conversations that you've had to have, relationship things. Life is a series of problems. We can see the truth of this even in the most famous verse or some of the most famous verses in the Old Testament, Psalm 23. Some of you know this probably by heart. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. How much better could it be? God is with me. And even though God is with me, I walk through the darkest valley. I mean, have you ever noticed that? That, that God is leading this person. The psalmist is writing. And where does he end up with God leading him? <laughs> He's like, whoa, why did you bring me here? Like, uh, you're with me, why am I in this hard situation? Why is this happening to me in my marriage? Why is this happening to me with my work? Why is this happening to me? God, if, if you're with me and I worship you and you're walking with me, but we see that even when we're walking with Christ, we will walk through the darkest valleys, or, or as the King James Version says, the valley of the shadow of death. A place where death happens, and it does happen. Parts of us die. We experience little deaths. Deaths of a relationship, deaths of a dream, deaths of, of a hope that we had that something might happen. And yet, as Maddie led us in singing, I will not be afraid for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. We need to embrace this truth. It's amazing how that truth changes, that life is difficult, life is hard, life is a series of problems. How we experience that truth is affected by whether we accept that truth, right? When we try to hide from that, we try to deny that, when we refuse to accept that, it makes our distress and our pain even greater. There's a book I read years and years ago that's the second best book I've ever read. The first is the Bible, for sure. But of every book I've read in my entire life, this is number two most important to me. A book by Dr. M. Scott Peck, a Christian psychiatrist. And in his book, he explores this. He explores this reality of pain and how there's a mentally unhealthy, spiritually unhealthy way to deal with that, and there's a mentally healthy and spiritually healthy way to do it. Think about all the hard things that we face in life. Divorce, mental illness, addiction, job loss, death, illness, injury, financial hardship, war, poverty, loneliness, grief, Texans. Sorry. 
You, you have to laugh to keep from crying. Crime, abuse, neglect. You guys are experts on these things. Some of you know much more about some of these than I do. Infertility, fear, estrangement in families, something I know about. Politics, something we all know about right now. Racism and all the isms. Animal neglect and abuse. Moving, having to move. Job change. Suicide. Heartbreak. Betrayals. Aging parents. Discernment. Endings of all kinds. Debt and financial pain. Meaninglessness. The great truth that life is filled with challenges and pain is explored in Peck's book, The Road Less Traveled. But it's also explored in Scripture. I mean, think about Scripture. Think about Noah's life. Think about Abraham's life. Think about Joseph's life. Think about Moses' life. The slavery of his people that he saw and that broke his heart. Him committing murder, Moses, because of that. Him having to flee. Flee everything he knows, leave everything he knows. Then God sending him back to face Pharaoh, the plagues, the Red Sea. And then when he got the people out, they turned against him. And they said, we want to go back. They, they didn't accept or appreciate him. And then, if that wasn't enough, they turned against him and God and made an idol. I mean, his life was one thing after another. Think about Jesus. He had to deal with the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the Romans, his own, disi his own disciples, his own best friends, his family, his hometown Nazareth when they tried to kill him. That's a story in the Bible. The cross. After the cross facing doubters who, who still didn't believe. Think about Paul and his life and all the trials and tribulations that he went through. It helps us kind of understand what Scripture says and the feeling that we get in Psalm 13. Oh, Lord, how long will you forget me? Forever? How long will you look the other way? How long must I struggle with anguish in my soul, with sorrow in my heart every day? How long will the enemy, whatever the enemy is for you, have the upper hand? Turn and answer me, O Lord my God. Restore the sparkle to my eyes or I will die. Don't let my enemies gloat saying we've defeated him. Don't let them rejoice at my downfall. But I trust in your unfailing love. I will rejoice because you've rescued me. I will sing to the Lord because he's good to me. Even the psalmist throughout scripture and so many of the psalms are laments about the hard things in life. Scott Peck in his book, The Road Less Travel, says that we must, if we are to be healthy, if we are to be spiritually healthy and mentally healthy, we have to accept this reality. But we don't, do we? And he confesses in the book that, that he whines about how hard things are in his life, that he can look at his own life and see how he said, oh, this is so hard, and woe is me, how this is happening to me, and it's worse than it is for anybody else, and how we moan, and all the things we do about something that is a baked-in reality in life. And that if we would just accept that reality, that we can transcend that reality. And he goes on to explain that you know, one of the great barometers of spiritual maturity is can we not only accept that truth, but can we embrace that truth? Which means changing from the mindset of, you know, whatever you're going through is, oh, I just got to get through this. I, isn't, that, isn't that how we think? I, I just got to get through this thing I'm going through. If I could just get through this, which, which really misses reality in some ways. Just getting through this makes no sense because there's just another thing there. right? You're not just getting through it. You're just getting to the next problem. So instead of just trying to get through it, what can I get from it? What can I get from this painful thing? What can I get from it? What can I learn from it? How can God redeem this in some way and use it to grow me? He makes the contention, he and many other psychologists like Carl Jung, that a central feature in all mental illness 
is that human proclivity for trying to avoid pain. That a, that a common thread in almost all mental illness, great and small, is our instinct to try to avoid pain. To try to go around it, try to deny it, try to avoid it, tell ourselves a false story so that we don't have to face it. That could be the pain of having a difficult conversation all the way up to the pain of acknowledging addiction or facing death or facing grief. Pain is a reality in our lives. And in Scripture, we see how Jesus faced that reality. In the Garden of Gethsemane, we see him grappling with it. And his decision to go to Jerusalem, even though he knew that they would try to kill him, we see him, in a healthy way, facing head-on that reality that life is a series of difficult things. Act two. Do you remember when you became a Christian? Can anybody remember the time? And I'm not going to have you come up and tell us about it today. All right? Maybe if you want to. Um, can, you re- can anybody here remember when they first became a Christian? All right? I see uh, like there's three of you. Okay. All right? I thought that would go differently. Um, maybe you can remember a time that was a spiritual mountaintop for you. I bet you can. Maybe you were on a retreat of some kind. Maybe you were in Bible study and you felt the Holy Spirit speaking to you. Maybe you were in a men's group. Maybe you were, you know, I don't know, at that point in your life where you, because of something that was going on, were desperate and turned to God and had an experience of God that was powerful. What was that like? Can you remember a time when you were, for lack of a better phrase, maybe on fire for God. You had such a deep sense. You could just feel God's presence. That time in your life where your faith was the most vivid and most powerful and you sensed God. Well, maybe about nine months ago, I heard a song. I just stumbled on this song by a guy named John Guerra. And he writes music that he calls devotional music. It's not praise and worship music like we do here. It's music. I wasn't familiar with this genre, genre, devotional music. But it's music that's intended to be like a prayer. And I heard this song, and it just cut me to the quick. And I've listened to it. It's been on heavy rotation for me the last night. I'm like, I listen to this song over and over again. And the song is about Remembering the way it was when we first met Jesus. Or remembering that time when you just felt overwhelmed by the Holy Spirit. And you felt so filled up. And you had such a potent sense of God's presence and power. That you could just run through a brick wall, you know. (laughs) That you just, you know, you were just so pumped up about God. Because you were at that moment of maybe conversion. Or you were at a place where you had just had a powerful encounter with God. I want you to listen to this song. And see if it kind of speaks to you the way it speaks to me. About remembering a time when you just had such zeal and faith and confidence in God. Take a listen. Just a kid Three chords I raised my hymn And how I raised my heart with it Teach us That one song That we all used to
kid Strum that old guitar The Lord will strum your heart For that's how all your best songs start song and he talks about in that song about remembering that song we used to sing when we first met God and he compares that to the faith of David who went rushing into Goliath and he says you know but now my feet aren't as swift I'm not as quick to run into battle for you God Teach me that song I used to know, where my faith was so pure and so zealous and so strong. That song that I think probably most of us knew, but that may be somewhere in the rear view now. I started the sermon by talking about how hard things are in life. Maybe kind of a downer. I apologize. But I think that saying it and naming it and owning it gives us power over it to transcend it. Instead of resisting something that is hard baked into reality, to embrace it. Because, in fact, we are equipped to face those things that we encounter. It's true that just because we're a believer in Christ doesn't mean that life's going to be easy. And it kills me when I hear within the greater Christian conversation people who portray the, the, the walk of faith as one that leads to prosperity or wealth or riches or easy street because it's obvious in Scripture that that's a bunch of baloney. How did it work out for the disciples? How did it work out for Jesus? How did it work out for Paul? How did it work out for Stephen the martyr? Was faith the road to riches for them? Was faith the road to easy street for them? No, it's, it's apparent that that's not true. It's apparent that life's going to be difficult and God doesn't promise it'll be easy, but he promises that he'll be with us. And because we're believers we have this huge inventory of resources to deal with the challenges that life throws at us. We have the power of praise that lifts us up to overcome these things. An example, Psalm 9, 1 through 3. I will praise you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of the marvelous things you've done. I'll be filled with joy because of you. 
I'll sing praises to your name. And what happens then? My enemies retreat. They staggered and died when you appeared. I love the juxtaposition here of praise and overcoming challenges. What I want to suggest to you tonight, and what I think comes out of that song to me, is the power of your spiritual autobiography. You can go back to that time. You can go back in your mind and your heart to that time when you were most on fire for God. Have you ever written down your spiritual autobiography? Have you ever written down the story of when you first met God? Have you ever written down the story of the time you felt closest to God or God spoke to you? Have you ever written down the time you prayed for that thing that seemed impossible, but God came through because God comes through? Have you ever written those things down? Because when we recount those things, as the psalmist are good to do, I will tell of the marvelous things you've done. We feel our spirits lifted. We feel ourselves raised up, and whatever it is we're facing then gets smaller. At the end of the little clip of the song, you know, it's awesome. You know, God says, you bring your sling, and I'll bring an army. We forget the resource we have. With whatever we're facing, we forget that we have the God of the universe on our side, that we're not alone. David didn't go running into Goliath by himself. No. The God of the universe was there with him. And then you read in Scripture, it says that he had five smooth stones that he had for his sling. And there's something like that that we all have as well. One of those things, we have each other. When we face hard things, we can turn to one another. That's one of those smooth stones we have to slay the giants in our lives. That we can go to a brother in Christ. We can go to a sister in Christ and say, hey, will you pray with me? Here's what I'm going through. We have God's word, which for me continues to be a source of strength. A story that I've read ten times. I read it today, and new things come out of it because of the Holy Spirit. We have prayer, this direct channel to God, not mediated through a pastor or a priest or a bishop or anyone else, but that we can talk directly to the God of the universe. We have worship, and man, do I love our worship team here because, man, it just, I get so, so much strength from singing God's praises. The enemies do retreat when we praise. We have things in our lives that equip us to face the hard things. And the greatest thing of all that we have is said right here. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not panic. The Lord your God will personally go ahead of you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. Whatever you're facing in life right now, and I suspect that we're all facing something, Don't go it alone. Don't leave behind all the resources that God has given you. He's given you us, your church family. He's given you his word. Within you, he's given you your own history with him. That is a tremendous resource. When I think back on the things that God has saved me from, gotten me through, guided me in, when I just stop and I start thinking about specific instances in my life where I was hopeless or felt like a situation was hopeless, but God just showed up in an amazing way, whatever I'm facing just shrinks down. It's magic. Like whatever challenge I'm facing shrinks down because I'm remembering how big God is. Yes, life is difficult, but God, our God, is big. Think about these words that Jesus himself said from John 16, I've told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I am have overcome the world. And with Christ in your life, 
and with your church family and with the strength and comfort of the Holy Spirit, you'll overcome too. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity to worship together. Thank you for reminding us that whatever we're facing, we're not facing it alone. We have our brothers and sisters in Christ to face it with us. We have your word which strengthens us and guides us. We have prayer, Lord, that is kind of a a way that we open the door of our lives to you. We have spiritual mentors in our lives. We have worship. We have praise. We have our own story of faith, our own spiritual autobiography. We have so many tools and weapons. You've given us this amazing inventory of resources to face the things we face. Lord, give us the wisdom to receive those gifts. Give us the wisdom to turn to you. Give us the wisdom to allow you to be God and to be with us with whatever we face. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to remind you that if you would like to support this church through your offering, there's lots of different ways to do that. When you give an offering, it supports our children's and youth ministry, things that are going on in that. Just examples, tomorrow is the back to school bash at 1030. Um, so if you want to drop back by, that no, it's after the 1030 service, it's at 1130. And it's in this parking lot out here by Riverview. There's going to be water games and barbecue. So feel free to drop by and invite others to come for that. That's the kind of thing we support. Also, our blessing of the backpacks next weekend, where we pray over our students and pray for them to have a great year. And then our ongoing children's ministry and our ongoing youth ministry and all the different ministries of the church, those are supported by your offering. So we thank you for your generosity. With that... Let's stand if you're able and sing God's praises. Love.
Would you all pray with me? Lord, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you that we get to come together and lift our voices up to you. Lord, when things are hard and when we don't know where to turn and are carrying some anger and sometimes anger at you, all we have to do is stop and remember that you're there with us and you give us a place to stand and you will walk through those hard times with us. Lord, fill us up to overflowing with your goodness and grace so that we can be Jesus to the people around us and that we can help those people walk through the hard times too. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us for worship tonight. You know, maybe as a product of the sermon, some things came to mind that you're wrestling with right now. And I'm really thankful that we have care ministers up front here if you'd like someone to pray with you. If you'd like to avail yourself of the resource that we have, we don't have to go it alone. We have God and then God has given us to one another. He's given me to you and you to me. So if there's something burdening your heart and you'd like to pray with someone, we have our care ministers here. We'd love for you to take advantage of that. With that, receive this benediction. Brothers and sisters in Christ, know that you are loved by God, that God is with you, and that God is for you, that God will never leave you or forsake you, and that God has put this community of love and faith around you to surround you with care and love so that you can see in flesh and bone that you're not alone. Go forth in the knowledge that you're loved and that God will be with you always. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Go in peace.